Okay. So we are waiting for one Miss Ashley Frawley to show up. And uh, hopefully we have audio. If not, that's a problem. Okay. So I am John Milton Bunch and co hosting today with Ashley Frawley. And we're going to be talking about transgenderism, we're talking about a manifesto for the support of transgenderism. And then we will also be talking about a uh, recent scientific literature review on the biological basis of transgenderism. So, um, yeah. So, let's see. That's just... Uh, All right. So I'll tell you what let's do. <laughs> okay. So, uh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, see, I, I'm kind of left high and dry. Not high and dry exactly, but, you know, I've got I've to gotta handle this on my own now. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. Um, well, let's just talk about, you know what I guess we'll do. If I end up not having a co-host, then what we're going to do is maybe do, I don't know, super chat questions or questions from the audience. Anyway, let's try something here. So what you're looking at here is a um, manifesto, the support of trans expression. So, you know, last week, Doug and Ashley talked about Anna Kasparian and Anna Kasparian's parent cancellation for talking about transgenderism. And... Uh, so I developed this manifesto for the support of trans expression to clarify exactly where I stand. And I tried to write it in such a way that was clear enough that if people, you know, a lot of people probably agree with me of a feeling that I probably say a lot of things here people agree with. But even if you don't, at least you can clearly identify what it is. So let's talk about some of these things. All right. So, definitions of sex and gender, right? So, what is sex? What is gender? Well, I'm making a distinction between biological sex and gender, one that recognizes the reality of both. Biological sex is a binary, meaningfully understood as a binary. People will say, well, what about intersex people? People don't fit neatly into the categories and so on and so forth. So biological sex, right? Because meaningfully understood as a binary, right? So it's a meaningful way to describe uh, what would you say? Attributes of a species, Sexual attributes of a species, reproductive attributes, of, uh, reproductive attributes of a species, and well, actually, Frawley has just popped in. Ashley Frawley, I am so glad to see you because I was sitting here about to die. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you went uh, you went ahead and went live. <laughs> hey, it was noon. Show you know, show has to uh, show must go on. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm just having a, a few issues with my uh, computer here that I was trying to sort out. Uh, it seems to have frozen, but if you can see me and hear me correctly, let's get the show on the road. Have you already played the uh, the intro for everyone? <laughs> no, I, no, I haven't. I, I just went in. This is a cold start, absolute cold start. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sublation Magazine show. And uh, I assume, John, you have introduced yourself. Yes, I've introduced myself <laughs> as a hanger-on of Sublation Media. Well, we're very glad to have you hanging on. Um, so last week, you watched us... Uh, you watched us uh, talk about the whole Anna Kasparian controversy, and you felt moved to write a manifesto of support for trans expression, which we've put in the links down below. Um, can you tell me a little bit um, what kind of moved you to write that? Yes. Well, that's an excellent question, and that's exactly what we were talking about. You came in <laughs> synchronous. Wonderful. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, to me, we have a definitional issue here with transgenderism. I talk to a lot of people who certainly would like to support trans rights, but who have questions about what transgenderism is and uh, are afraid to talk about it because they don't want to be called a transphobe, et cetera, et cetera. So I just simply wrote or clarified my position. I feel like probably a lot of people tend to agree with me, but even if you don't, at least I've clarified it in such a way that you, you know, someone who doesn't agree can easily identify what it is that they find objectionable or don't agree with, or so on and so forth. So that that's the genesis of it. Great. Um, so I I I found it very interesting because you I, I guess we could sort of go through it little by little because perhaps it will clarify some people's own understanding of the issue and what they think is important. Um, I, I know I think that I've seen this a couple of times. So I've got a very good friend, an old friend from university, who is a trans woman, and um, she wrote me long, long time ago uh, an article where she was just she was saying, I'm just so frustrated with the whole debate online. And it's just very simple. Uh, there's a difference between sex and gender. And if we could just clarify that, then the issue disappears. And it seems to me that you've tried to do that, too. You start out by uh, differentiating between sex and gender. And I wondered, do you think that's sufficient? Do you think that that's where the issue lies? We're just confusing the two things. Well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, in you know, in general, I think that um, we we confuse sex and gender, right? When I think clearly, sex is a biological reality, right? It's a meaningful way to describe, uh, you know, repro biological reproduction and morphology and so on and so forth. You know, male and female are nominal categories. That's the way all biological categorization works. Not everything's going to fit, you know, not every individual is going to fit into the category, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. So, you know, you got to recognize that, right? And also, I think, I mean, to me, the biological sex someone is born with, I mean, that is, defi it defines their body that has to have some impact on the way that they experience the world it has to have some unique impact right so i think biological sex also makes some kind of unique impression on the person anyway so yeah and then gender is uh you know i think like uh and this comes from for example um judith butler which is gender is performative right so gender is something we perform to other people most of the time for most people it reflects their biological sex, but it doesn't have to. And it's just social convention that gives gender its form, right? So I guess what I would say is that, you know, people have, everyone has a biological sex. Gender is usually the way that people express that biological sex, but it doesn't have to be, you know, or rather the form it takes could be anything. So biological male could express himself as society expects a female to. But at the same time, someone could build a, a gender that wasn't male or female. So anyway, hope I didn't go off on too much of a tangent, but that's okay. So I think the issue is that it's not it's not as simple as just differentiating between the two things um, for a wide range of issues uh, reasons. So one. Um, What's happening now is that I actually think that the sex gender distinction is helpful. And if if anyone is interested in the history of that uh, that distinction, 
I'll tell you about it. But anyways, I, I actually do think in many ways it, is, it can be helpful. However, what is happening now is that the sex gender distinction is collapsing because maintaining that distinction produced a number of issues, issues that come out in what you are writing. So when you define, when you say that there's a difference between sex and gender, then you're able to say in this biological sense, trans women are not women. Right. And this becomes an issue. Um, and then because there are people who want to take it further and to say that sex is also socially constructed um, and that there's, you know, a continuum through which you can define genitalia, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, this has become quite problematic. So it's not so simple. It's not as simple as kind of differentiating. And then the other issue is that we can start to tangle ourselves up in knots around gender. And I think this is kind of where we get into an issue here. So you write, uh, when we're talking about gender, on the other hand, we're in the realm of social expectations and culture. In this case, definitions of male and female are much more loosely defined, malleable, and subjective. The only answer we can give in this context to the question, what is a woman, for example, is perhaps a woman is someone who presents and expresses herself in a way consistent with social expectations for the way a woman presents and expresses herself, which is obviously a circular definition. Because what you're saying is, you mean a woman is someone who enacts the behavior that her culture associates with her sex, right? right. But then even this is a bit of a mess because does this mean you're not a woman if you reject the things your society, your society associates with your sex? Well, so if we use woman as the shorthand for gender and you, like no woman feels entirely at home with like, no one's like, oh yeah, sex rules and expectations for women, that's my bag. Like, you know, you accept some things, you play with some things, you reject other things. It's quite complicated. So if you reject these gendered norms, are you not a woman in the social sense? And it makes it very say, difficult then to contest gender norms within the realm of womanhood, whatever that means, the expectations that are associated with sex, which are something that people have been contesting since, I don't know, the rise of the socialist movement, <laughs> at least, and not even in socialism. I mean, obviously you had like Marquis de Condorcet at the beginning uh, during the Enlightenment, uh, during the French Revolution, John Stuart Mill. There's a lot of contestation around sex what used to be called sex roles and is now gender so it's it's not so simple you see but go on sorry no no okay so i mean what you're correct it's just that i think what we're talking about here is how do we consider gender for purposes of public policy right so what i'm doing is i'm taking a very sort of social libertarian perspective and I'm saying that gender ultimately is a behavioral choice, right? So from an academic perspective, gender could be a lot of things and it's not as simple as saying it's a behavioral choice, right? But to me, when we're talking about, you know, laws and other sorts of social restrictions on someone, we have to look at it, you know, in that way. So in other words, um, you, you know, gender isn't, gender is purely, becomes purely a, a something that's just socially constructed, right? I mean, I think we seem to be pre, I mean, what was it going, where was I going with that? Anyway, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But, <laughs> but the point is, um, yeah, I think that, uh, so, Gender becomes, in a sense, it, it's a role, right? It's a role that someone takes on. Um, it's a socially constructed role. And someone sort of identifies whether they are in the role, and then society sort of loosely defines attributes of the role or features of the role. So, you know, I suppose whether any individual is a member of the role is going to vary depending on who the observer is. You, you see what I'm saying? So we, we have this kind of loose collective statistical kind of uh, definition of women, of male and female when we're talking about genders. Right? So that's so, so that's it. So the point is that 
it's ultimately, if we look at it that way, then it's ultimately a matter of self-expression, which the government should not be restricted. So that, that's my basic idea. Of course, I don't really care why someone is trans. Um, it's quite possible that, you know, trans is, is a uh, sort of a contemporary social phenomenon, could be somewhat transient. In other words, could be in 50 years, you won't see so many trans, you know, people won't be presenting as trans as much. But nonetheless, regardless, um, you know, if someone wants to, if a, biolog if a biological male wishes to take on the mannerisms and dress of the social expectations for a female, then, okay, it's not, it's none of my business, I guess. I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, and that's what most people agree with. So if you look at surveys, most people agree with statements like what you just said, that uh, most people have a live and let live attitude. It's just when it comes down to what that actually means in practice, there's much more disagreement. So it, it means, is this a literal thing? Do we then redefine sex classes? right? In sport is the famous, uh, <laughs> uh, the famous issue, you know, the dressing room issue, these sorts of things. And people will say, oh, it's just sort of made up and contrived controversies. And to a certain extent, they are. Um, but to a certain extent, they are not, you know, um, that you have to, something that works and is fine in very small and rare circumstances, you still have to think about how it makes sense when things are scaled up. Right. <laughs> if this becomes a, a bigger and bigger issue, then you do have to think about, well, it's fine. Oh, we sure. just make exceptions in these particular cases. But then, uh, well, you have to make sure that it's fair in all cases. There, there's definitely definitely social fallout from, you know, from from sort of shifting that way of thinking about it. But but sure. But so, uh, to me, that just may be what has to happen. Yeah. So the other, the next paragraph in your your manifesto is at the level of gender, the male female binary itself become uh, become simply one possible framework work along which a gender could be constructed. There are an infinite number of ways a person could express themselves. Now here we just get to the weird territory where it's like society tends to classify particular ways of being and expression as being more or less female and more or less f male. And our society and our culture does that. And there all there's all sorts of disagreement within our society and culture, which is inc incredibly pluralistic, never mind cross-culturally. And you, you just start to wonder, yeah. like, how much, how uh, helpful is it to think of these forms of self-expression along gendered lines? And that's kind of what you were talking about before, where there's a, a social aspect to this in the sense of it being temporarily new. And what we talked about last week around the idea of culture-bound illnesses, that once a category becomes, as, as Ian Hacking writes, once a category becomes available to people, it's not just like naming a flower. Um, when you, you uh, the category becomes part of your experience and you have a, di a kind of dialectical relationship with that category and you become the category. The, once the category becomes available for your own self-expression, it's not just uh, something that describes a pre-existing way of being, the kind, the human kind, and the category grow together, um, which I think we we agree on. No, I mean yeah, that's that's basic. That's basic. Uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? social sociobiology? Or <laughs> I mean, but yes, we agree on that. I mean, the, the behavior you see, right, is a combination of the biology the person brings to the situation plus their experience. Mm -hmm. But th and then you continue to say, um, thus an infinite number of gender expressions. In this context, a trans woman is a woman. So in the in the context of like expression, if you more or less kind of pass, then you are a woman. And this is interesting because this is how it used to be. <laughs> this was the kind of tacit acknowledgement that society had given to transgendered people in the past. Whereas if you, it was if you passed. And even if you kind of didn't, but people recognize that you were trying, trying then right, they right, would right. use that particular pronoun, the pronoun that most matched what appeared, what you appeared to be uh, attempting to pass as. Now, that worked, but obviously there's an oppressive side to that because 
why should you then force people to go through sometimes invasive surgeries to achieve that passing when it's more and more it's more difficult for some people than others? And so the idea is that you you shouldn't have to do that, which I recognize. But then this then leaves us with womanhood as a kind of essence, as opposed to something that is enacted. And this then becomes quite difficult for a lot of people to accept because most people were on board with the idea of equality in terms of sexuality. And then gender identity kind of piggybacked onto that in the early, well, beginning in really in the 1990s in a, in a big way in the United States. And then in the early 2000s, major international lesbian and gay groups began to ex ex expand to include gender identity, which was a little bit controversial even within those groups at the time. Um, yeah, but but there was uh, a difficulty there in that identity is different than sexuality. And while the concept of sexuality is really widespread, the concept of gender identity is less certain, less concrete, less clearly identifiable, uh, and less, it's not a concept that is in most people's kind of vocabulary, then this became a lot more difficult a lot more difficult for kind of everyday people to accept when they were confronted with it already in legislation. And that's kind of where the issue came up. Um, so, you know, you can say like a, a trans person who passes as that particular uh, gender is that gender for all intents and purposes, that is the case. The issue became that uh, there was a certain amount of oppression in that that people wanted to push back against and kind of say, well, why? Why do I have to go through all of that? Well, okay, question about that. And this is really sort of an empirical question I don't necessarily know the answer to. And that is, what motivates someone to present in a certain way? Is it because they want to pass? Or is it because this is how they are sort of internally driven to express themselves. You see what I'm saying? In other words, I'm not sure that the reason someone would have transgender or you know gender reassignment surgery is simply to pass so much as it's a form of self-expression they feel mm -hmm. compelled to do. No, that's and, fine and that I'm some people feel compelled to do that, but others don't. And I think there tends to be, and there has always historically been, I think, uh, a lot more acceptance for trans people who passed easily, either via surgeries or just luck. So Caroline, what was it, Caroline Cossey, am I saying that correctly? The Bond girl. Uh -huh. um, and she was hu hugely uh, successful. Oh, okay, maybe not. Well, not hugely successful. She was successful in, in, man in changing some laws, but there was a lot of support behind her very early on. We're talking in the 1980s because she passed extraordinarily well as a woman. And, and I think even without uh, at least facial surgeries. Um, but so lots of people are, are okay with that, okay with going through the trouble or it's easier for them to, they don't have to go through any trouble, but some people aren't. And there's a certain amount of resentment that that's the expectation which I, I understand, I, I feel empathy for, but then this introduced the additional problem of if it's not about passing, then it's about some kind of intrinsic identity that is right. unclear to most people. And that debate has not really been had. By the time that became, it became clear that something like this was going on, it was already institutionalized into policy. There hadn't really been any public debate about what gender identity means. And so this created a lot of difficulty at least in, in public discussions that did emerge around exactly what does this mean? And now people will call it like gender woo and stuff or like an internal kind of gendered essence for which there's no kind of explanation that has been widely agreed upon. So it's, it's, it's quite complicated, right? It's not just about passing now. Hmm. Um, well, right. And see, that's why, you know, again, this is why it, it all comes down. The only we can't, you can't make policy based on what you assume is in a person's head, right? The only thing we can do is base policy on a person's behavior. And to me, everything about gender is about behavior and self-expression. And that's why we have to look at it. We have to look at it in that way. I mean, 
in a sense, it's like, I mean, why should we, why should we look at someone that, you know, someone that takes on the sort of the mannerisms, the, the speech, the dress of, you know, of the sort of incongruent socially expected gender, what's fundamentally different to everyone else between that and that person just deciding they wanted to get their whole body covered in tattoos. See what I'm saying? Well, it, it means that you are, there isn't like another group of people who are the tattooed people <laughs> well, <I laughs> who mean, have the, a different I'm set of... <laughs> person, you know, what I'm saying is the person's internal motivation and drive to, you know, to be, to, to appear to other people as trans is, you know, I'm sure not the same as someone's internal motivation and drive to get tattooed, but from the perspective of society, why should the two be treated different? In other words, all we're talking about is the way someone's presenting themselves. You know what I mean? So why should we be concerned with why they're doing that? What do you mean? Oh, what their internal motivation is? Yeah, I mean, why should we, I mean, from a public, I mean, it, from an academic perspective, sure, it's interesting, you know, it's something we, we want to know, but from a public policy perspective, from the perspective- No, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's people. just, it, I think it matters because some people are not presenting in that way and resent the idea that you must. Right, so you don't have to pass it, it like uh, one of the goals of legislation. Give me an example um, of this. I'm not, I can't quite wrap my Yeah, head so if you think uh, it's one of the goals of legislation is obviously gender self identification or having a leg legislation in place that makes changing one's gender legally very easy um, and not requiring sort of medicalization. So there was a, a movement to demedicalize trans identities that's been in existence for a very, very long time. Um, and part of that was to say that this isn't a medical issue, this isn't a problem, but also you shouldn't require surgeries in order to get this certificate, which is what I was talking about before when I said that I, I was sympathetic to the idea that why should you have to like um, go through experimental, in many cases, surgeries or surgeries that um, don't well, have, at, the, at this moment are not great. Well, who says uh, in, someone should? In order uh, for instance, Malta and lots of different countries, in order to legally change one's sex uh, on a birth certificate, or I'm not even sure if birth certificates, but on one's passport or on one's identification, you had to have a sex change operation. Oh, and so oh, legislation oh. was was easiest So uh, in, in gaining simpler forms of gender self-identification in these countries that previously had this kind of medicalized pathway that you had to have a medical intervention in order to change your sex. Um, and so they wanted to change that, and that's what they did. So in Malta, for instance, they managed to change that, I think, in 2007. So in a lot of the, in a lot of countries that, or for a lot of activists and a lot of groups, that is the goal, is to make it as simple as possible to change one's gender without needing to go through medical interventions, to just change it as easily as possible. So this was the move, this was part of this movement. And so the issue then was that in the past, I think part of the reason why that's why the legis the, part of the reason why the legislation was in that form before was medicalized, because it was recognizing that people had gone through an enormous difficulty in order to change their sex, like to change their sexual, the outward appearance of their sex, at least. Um, and that they were now living for all intents and purposes as the opposite sex, and they sh that should be recognized. And so they should be able to marry the partner of their choice and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was, that was something that publicly had a lot, I think, a lot of support. Um, at, you know, at, I mentioned the example of the Bond girl, um, who anyway was intersex um, and was campaigning and was had this sort of campaign to be able to legally marry her uh, her fiance at the time. And I think if you go through, I've gone through the sort of newspaper coverage of her case and it was mostly supportive. So that kind of difficult pathway was recognized within legislation. But the problem with that is that, as I said, why would you expect people to go through that? But then if you don't, and you can just sort of change your gender at will and it's something like a feeling, this is something that people 
were less on board with. And so how that was got, how uh, that was passed into policy in a lot of countries, a, a quicker and easier form of gender transition that was non-medicalized um, was by bundling it in with um, other policies that had um, more widespread support like gay marriage. And so a lot of people came across the legislation after it had already been institutionalized. Um, and what, I, what I'm alluding to here is a very controversial report, which you can no longer find on the internet, um, by Iglio and Thompson Reuters uh, and um, Denson's law firm, um, which took stock of best practice of, of um, LGBTIQ groups across Europe. And this was what they recommended. And throughout the report, they talk about how public attitudes are sort of they're falling behind or they are just behind. And the best thing to do is to avoid as much public contestation as possible. And they sort of talk about the regret that in the UK that wasn't possible and it became very controversial. Um, and they say you, you you should bundle policies to provide, um, uh, what's the word, a veil. Sorry, I've got the report here. A, uh, a veil of protection behind more, uh, less controversial policies. And this is what I was what I was getting at when I said, that was the issue that once it became public knowledge, people were like, what is this thing, gender identity, right? Like they, a lot of people were on board with the idea of live your life as you wish. If you present as the opposite sex or I see that you are trying, <laughs> fine, <laughs> that's great. Do You do you. Um, but then the idea that you could simply change uh, very easily because of something called identity was less widespread. And then the implications of that was then less widespread, uh, less widely discussed until it was actually happening. So there wasn't this debate in society. And the argument that I have made about this in past Sublation Magazine um, episodes is that when you do that, um, the problem with that kind of quick path to legislation, uh, or what Weber called an exercise of naked power, is you... In modern pluralistic societies, the exercise of power has got to be legitimated in some way. And if you don't do that, you're likely to lose that power in the long run. And so without legitimacy, without an underlying legitimacy in debate and kind of working out the minutiae of this, um, you, it engendered a backlash. Sure. And that's, that's where we are right now, where no, only the most extremes kind of talk to each other. Right. No, I, that certainly makes sense. It, it boils down to this, you know, I mean, I, I was just, as you were talking, I just thought of something that is sort of analogous to, to this issue of how do you categorize someone in this socially defined role? You know, I mean, how is it that, you know, what makes a biological male a gender, the gender female? There used to be for years, there was this Hall big Halloween party in San Francisco where they had, um, I went to it, a, I don't know, a few times over the years. And a lot of, lot, inside a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of crazy costumes, a lot of nudity, stuff like that. And as the internet became popular, they started having a problem with, with people who weren't really there to go to the party, but coming in with cameras to take pictures and post them on, uh, you know, Instagram and so on, just just to sort of get social credit from the pictures. So they had to institute a policy that said you couldn't come in unless you were in a costume, right? So then the issue became, well, what constitutes enough of a costume for someone to be a member of the party rather than just there to take pictures? Same thing you have here, right? I mean, that, I mean, it's just it's an impossible problem to solve because you got this socially constructed thing, right? The, the category is is socially constructed, right? In this case, what does it mean? What the gender of woman, the gender of man, the gender? I mean, the the category. You know, what are the attributes of a woman? What are the attributes of a man? What are the attributes of someone that's here to go to the party? Ultimately, the those attributes are so poorly the you can't you know so poorly defined from that perspective that it's you know you reach a point where you can't categorize, and that's what we see. Yeah, of course. Like at the end of the day, we are humans. We live in a society, and we have to negotiate 
categories that are not given and handed down from God. And this is kind of the issue that we're having with a huge range of of, of categories and uh, norms and morals and so on is that we've come to this realization that there is nothing solid that we can just hook into, that we have to make judgments about how we're going to live our lives, which is really interesting because you can see that there was, you, you see that this new kind of hyper liberalism that can emerge out of that has come head on, crashed head on to a deep, deep desire to avoid that normlessness that could potentially result from having lost the anchor for truth. So you, you have this idea of like, oh, we can live whatever way we want. We can choose to live whatever way we want. But uh, because we're born this way, you know, wow. and that was the argument that we got in trouble for last week. Doug and I were in the yeah, parent yeah. room I where we were trying that. to say we weren't saying that being gay is a choice. That's not what we were saying. We we're saying, but if it was a choice, why would it be bad? Why well, would it be bad to be gay? Right. You I should be able like to just that. live the way you want to live. Sorry. The whole ahead. born this way argument has never made sense to me simply because I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, older. I watched. I'm a straight guy who watched the gay rights movement develop over the decades, you know, and it seemed to me that, and again, this is just my observation of it and take it for what that's worth, but it seemed to me that in the period between Stonewall and sometime like in the eight, late 80s, uh, uh, from then until AIDS, I guess, the AIDS uh, epidemic. The attitude of gay people that I knew was, I'm gay, I don't care if you like it. I mean, it's like, I'm gay and fuck you if you don't like it. You know what, you know what I'm saying? Which I kind of respected because what they were saying is, I'm, I don't need you to understand why. This is just how I'm going to be. And if you don't like it, too bad. <laughs> I mean, to me, that I like, I mean, that was a classic, to me, that was a strong libertarian argument but then some then it changed right then it it, it sometime in the 90s it seems like it changed and, the, and it became no you know gay people are you know can't help there's something biological right they're just born this way and then that extended to everything right and i don't know that there's much real relationship between trans trans between transgenderism and you know homosexuality so but somehow the, they all get lumped together and, and they all become, you know, something that is physiologically driven. Um, anyway. So. No, I, 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 I get that, definitely. Um, and that was something that earlier generations of gay rights activists had, had said as well, um, or, you know, the ones who are still around say, well, that's what we used to argue back in the day. It was like, this is who I am, just kind of deal with it or what, how I'm going to live. Um, and of course, theorists rejected the idea of uh, homosexuality being a kind of identity and being uh, the essentialism. Uh, and that's just flipped entirely to where the search for a gay gene was seen as something that was quite progressive, um, which it, it could be or, or whatever, but it's just sort of like, I'm going to live my life and you you deal with it should be on equal as, as one of the commenters said, I think I put it up on the screen. Secret Asian Dan said um, that should be on equal footing with born this way. But it seemed like that somehow losing the argument. But uh, what I was mentioning before around this idea of like crashing head on this sort of demedicalization and medicalization crashing head on. Um, I think we have this problem generally in society where there's a movement to kind of demedicalize all sorts of things on the one hand, while there's a hypermedicalization of all sorts of other things. And um, it's so some of the hyper, the demedicalization isn't really a rejection of the medicalization of everyday life, but the, red, the, the um, rejection of the doctor's authority to medicalize. So, well, what, it, it, you know, it, it works. Medicalization of mental health issues right um it, it's always worked to remove stigma because you know if, if you turn it into a disease i mean this is the disease model of alcoholism addiction you know i mean if you look at the history of addiction or alcoholism for example right it it went from a moral 
failing to, you know, to, to a health concern because it was medicalized, right? Because of the uh, disease model. Now, in reality, it's not as simple as saying it's a disease, right? It's, I mean, certainly there are probably physiological factors that come into play, but it's also a result of the person's interaction with the world and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, you know, we, we've always had that, that, that medicalization of everything, right? So, so someone, you know, someone decides that they feel differently than most other people feel and they, they feel like they want to, you know, they're a biological male, but they feel like they want to present themselves. They have this internal need to present themselves to the world as a female. They see themselves as, you know, a female and, uh, you know, and, and, and that gets medicalized as a, a you know, in no small part as a, as a way to uh, destigmatize it. Because of course, you can't help it. Yeah, um, there's a commenter, Kushluk, who's quite annoyed because the problem that he has with the argument that I'm making that the two things should be on equal footing is that there was, you know, a hundred or more years of conversion therapy that, do, that did a huge amount of damage and didn't work. Now you can, I, and I, this is the thing, I don't disagree with that. I'm not saying that it is or isn't biological. I'm trying to make a stronger argument that even if it is biological, it wouldn't be wrong if it wasn't. You know what I mean? Right. It's, okay, it's well, I don't, I'm not seeing how this isn't landing. But the, the thing is that conversion therapy would also be wrong even if it wasn't biological. It would be the wrong thing to do because you should be able to live your life as you wish, that you shouldn't have compulsory, compulsory heterosexuality. Right. I, I mean, conversion therapy was horrendous. I, I mean, certainly that's not... I mean, if you believe that people have the right to express themselves the way they want, you're not going to be in support of conversion therapy. Yeah, and then also... Uh, I'm not, I'm, I thought this was common knowledge, but the word gender itself as applied to sex roles came from a kind of conversion therapy. So it, it came from the first gender identity research clinic, which opened in California um, in the 1950s, I think, 1962 in California, um, where they used, differentiated between sex and gender to make the argument that gender was not innate that your behaviors related to your uh your sex were not necessarily related to your sex these were things that were learned in childhood they wanted to make that argument and that sounds like quite progressive but actually the reason why they wanted to make that argument was that they were developing therapies and saw it as their mission to encourage so-called feminine boys and masculine girls to behave in ways that match their natal sex that was the purpose of it, was to change the behavior to match the sex. I, I just want you to think about that for a minute. But anyways, that's where the word came from. Uh, that, oh no, the word obviously was being used in linguistics. Um, but then it became a shorthand for uh, women's issues because you know feminists had always been tr trying to denaturalize, not always, but had uh, been denaturalizing the idea of, of sex roles and to argue that these things were not innate at the same time as recognizing that women's capacity to give birth was a huge part of their oppression and making uh, um, arguments around certain uh, concessions that needed to be given to, given to women in the workplace, such as exemption from hard labor during pregnancy. That was a big thing. But they didn't use the word gender to make sense of this. Um, uh, many feminist groups use the word, uh, use the term sex roles. And into the late 1960s, 19, no, 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 sorry, uh, into the late 1970s and the 1980s, gender became a shorthand for women's issues. And that's how it was for a long period of time until we had this sort of belated rediscovery of gender as uh, a separation, as, as separated from sex and as a kind of identity. Um, anyways, so it has a legacy in a kind of conversion therapy. Someone is asking about uh, uh, what I call transgenderism related physical interventions and children. That's always a hot topic. So oh God. Asks if it is a, uh, um, 
what how is it not um child abuse would someone say yeah so going back to your um, convergent therapy someone called say well how is that not convergent therapy what's that um saying that um yes oh the argument that children who appear to be questioning their gender identity or appear to vary from behave in ways that vary from their natal sex are uh, actually girls or actually boys is a kind of conversion therapy for children who would otherwise grow up to be gay. Is that the argument that's being put forward? Well, simply, I, I suppose, simply, if there's a young biological male who's, you know, who is expressing some kind of concern, which is interpreted to be concern over gender, how is putting that child on puberty blockers on uh, or otherwise, uh, you know, encouraging them to express as female, how is that not a form of conversion therapy? In other words, you're, you're converting them to something else. Well, yeah, and that's what it uh, was used for in, you know, Iran, for, uh, for instance, in which um, it was preferable for someone to be, uh, to have a sex change, so-called sex change surgery um rather than be homosexual that that was the the case and why why iran was kind of an early oddly progressive nation in that sense but one of the things that you write in your manifesto is um you talk about children mm -hmm. experiencing distress over gender issues um which is interesting um <laughs> which I suppose we'll get into in, in later, this idea of like, that this distress should be interpreted as a gender issue. Well, I, I don't know that it should be. Here's, here's my thoughts on that. And part of this is a reaction to what Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, which is just uh, stigmatize any child who expresses concern over gender issues. In other words, I don't think, you know, in our culture today, when these, you know, when gender identity is such a big issue, it's not surprising to me that a child who experiences some kind of psychological or emotional distress um, interprets it as a gender identity issue, right? They very well could see that. I mean, that's, you know, I, it, I highly doubt, this is the thing, like people think that children are like born with these buzzwords on their lips. Like, well, I mean, they, they're not going to have, you know, they've got, um, they're not going to necessarily know the language. But in other words, you, you know, I, I mean, when, when anyone, a child, anyone experiences psychological or emotional distress, they look for a narrative to hang it on. In other words, mm -hmm. why do I feel this way, right? So that stuff is created by society, right? The, the, the narrative to hang it on, okay? So if, um, if the child hears about somebody else who was a boy, you know, who was born a boy, but they really, but they really think they're a girl and they were really upset about it, but now they're not, this becomes something, this becomes a possible narrative to hang the stress on, right? So a child, a child who voices the stress over gender identity is a child who's voicing emotional and distress, right? That doesn't mean you have to interpret that as, oh, well, certainly here we have a cl case of clear case of gender dysmorphia. You know, let's now right. look at the list of treatments for it, right? It just means that the child is experiencing distress that needs to be taken seriously. It, should, it can't be written off as, oh, you, you know, it needs to be taken seriously, right? So um, what you do about it, completely different issue. And, you know, as I talked about later in here, we don't know enough science. So we don't, you know, we don't have a science to tell us much about this phenomenon of gender dysphoria. And we, we don't have much of a science to tell us what she, what we should do about it, if anything. So um, while I think that parents ultimately are the ones that have to make choices about physical interventions with children, they have to do it, you know, in an environment where they've got solid, thorough information about benefits and you know, risks and benefits and and so on. So 
whether that exists currently is a completely different issue. I'm just stating that parents are the ones that need to make those decisions. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of, um, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, and I think that's really tricky territory because I know that people who feel really, really passionately about these things in one way or another will often, first of all, we point to children for various reasons, good reasons, um, obviously. <laughs> um, but when we when the issue of childhood comes up, parents become the target and it is very tempting for people to then say well parents should not be allowed to make a decision either way um, and this has created all kinds of problems so on the one hand people have begun to target the concept of guilt competence um, and so if a parent disagrees they say oh parents shouldn't have a say Right. So if a parent says, no, you shouldn't transition, well, the parent shouldn't have a say because the child can have guilt competence. And that is that the child can judge for themselves or the, the, the doctor can sort of make a judgment that the child can judge for themselves what they're doing. And this was important for abortion because what happens is that a lot of young girls will feel very, very bad about telling their parents <laughs> if they get pregnant. And so you had a lot of horrific issues that came up as a result of women hiding their pregnancies or trying to get backroom abortions, this kind of thing. And so guilt competence is this idea that even without parental consent, a, a young woman, a girl should be able to get an abortion um, because she is capable of recognizing the impact that a child and a pregnancy would have on her life. So now people have come for that. And it's having this kind of this knock on effect on Gillett competence, which is just has been accepted and is this sort of very careful kind of um, uh, compromise, I suppose, that we have in society that allows for abortion. Uh, without parental consent. And now people, once that gets applied to transgender issues, start then uh, ro rolling back uh, the, the, its um, acceptability in terms of abortion. <laughs> so this became a, a really big issue. But then the other thing is too, like then you, you, when you chip away at parental autonomy on both sides, you then what happens is when the other side, again, this is the naked power approach, you're not going to be the only one who exercises naked power. Right. Right. When you say, no, no, we can't have a debate about these things. No, no debate can be had in either direction. <laughs> then when your side gets power, you just crush the other side. So this is what's happening in, in America right now and in Canada, where parental rights are being taken away by both sides <laughs> for and against. Well, right? I mean, and that's that's not helpful either. You can it's say not. It's just parents the way I can do this, make these decisions, but perhaps they shouldn't would be a good argument. Sorry. Well, you know. You have, in America, parents are given such broad leeway into how they raise their children. I mean, you know, you've got parents who convince their children there's an invisible sky god who's going to send who's going to send them to hell, or at least is going to be mad if they masturbate. You know, I mean that we know that creates anxiety problems and things like that for the for children growing up and as adults and so on, but. You know, we wouldn't think about restricting that. So I don't know, you know, if, if there's a, if, if there's some overzealous use of puberty blockers, you know, I mean, maybe that's just what has to happen. Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, you can have an open conversation about whether or not, like without saying you shouldn't be allowed in all instances to raise your children the way you fucking wish. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you bundle this stuff together with everything else, you're going to create a hellscape, you know, instead of saying, no, parents should not be able to decide these things. And we need to be more heavy handed in how parents raise their children in either direction for religion yeah. or, or without religion. You can just say, yes, parents can make this decision, but can we have an open debate about whether or not they should make that decision? Do you know what I mean? Like that, and we need to be able to debate the merits and demerits oh, of this. Absolutely. And, and right now, there's not, right now, the literature, scientific literature is thin. We ju mm -hmm. It just doesn't tell us much, which I guess maybe in a parent room, we'll get to the, uh, to that report. And I mean, it's what it yeah. says. It's thin. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are reasons for that. So let's go to the parrot room, actually, because we have run over by two minutes. So we will continue this discussion in the parrot room and be a little looser uh, <laughs> in what we are and what we are saying. So yeah, we join us. Talked about trans women, trans uh, women in sports or any of that stuff. Yet. No, I know. I'm All going through it little by little. I've got it. I got in front of me here. Where, where's my camera? I got it in front of me here, and I'm doing going through it little by little. So let and then we've got the report to to the science to come to. So this is the second half of the conversation in the parrot room. If you want to join us, go to www.patreon.com/slash/diet soap, and we will see you there. Like and subscribe. See ya.